Welcome to Wildspire. You get to be a fly on the wall for my intimate conversations with entrepreneurs who are changing the world. I'm your host, Stephanie Benedetto, coach, storyteller, and unmarketer at The Awakened Business, helping coaches and change-making entrepreneurs unleash their inspired message and share it with playful unmarketing. I'll ask curious questions and explore uncharted waters with my guests today. Anything can happen when we step into the unknown of infinite creativity, and that's where we're going to play. My guest today is Vix Anderton. When I first encountered Vix's videos on YouTube, I loved the strength of her point of view the way she would point to something other people often miss or misunderstand, a sort of grounded contrarianism that I found very intriguing. In this conversation, we talk about her discovery of embodied choice for opening up new possibilities beyond what the mind can conceive let me tell you a little bit more about Vix Anderton. Vix Anderton is a trauma-informed, certified somatic coach, authentic relating facilitator, and menstruality mentor. Her work is grounded in nervous system resourcing and regulation to help people connect to the medicine of their rhythms and cycles. She is committed to helping people embody their innate wisdom and power reconnecting them with their natural flow, intelligence, and creativity. She is an advocate for using the principles of embodiment, cyclical living, and authentic relating to help rebel perfectionists manage their energy and emotions to bravely build more sustainable and authentic ways of being. She is the author of Enough, an Imperfect Antidote to Perfectionism. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Vix Anderton. Hi, Vix, and welcome to the Wildspire podcast. I'm happy to have you as my guest today. Mm, yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm feeling really excited about our, our conversation today. Well, good. I'm looking forward to it as well. So I've been looking at some of your videos that are now appearing in my YouTube feed and listening to the conversations, noticing the conversations that we've been having and you said something about really enjoying being brave and playing on, on your edge, on the edge of different topics. What does that mean to you? And why do you love it? <laughs> yeah, so for me, um, let's come from a colleague of mine, this idea of being on my tender edge. Um, as somebody who really values learning, to learn to do something different means I have to be on the edge of my comfort zone. Right? I have to uh, be practicing doing something that is unfamiliar and perhaps uncomfortable. What I love about this idea of the tender edge, it's not about forcing myself to do that or pushing myself beyond my limits. But yeah, finding that kind of sweet spot where I feel resourced and I'm doing something new. And there's, yeah, I guess I use the word kind of playing with that almost uh, unconsciously. But there's something about that sweet spot of, oh, this is a little... There's a, there's a little like fresh on of excitement that that the kind of it doesn't feel like nervousness or anxiety or a fear of the unknown. It's like oh, there's possibility and space here and maybe something new, and that does feel playful in my in my system. And especially as a recovering perfectionist, where it's so easy for me to get into learning means I have to be good at something straight away, and I have to get the A grade, and I have to be the best. Reminding myself that. I might just try something new and see how it goes and, and, and yeah, be a little playful and curious with it. That changes my whole embodiment. It actually puts me into learning mode rather than brutalize myself because I think I should be doing better mode. That sounds like a really good choice. <laughs> Well, it is. And I would have to say it's a choice that's only been available to me uh, relatively recently. 
you know, I might have intellectually understood some of this, but somatically, like in my body, I I wouldn't, I didn't know how to do that. Um, so yeah, that's been something I've been like, practicing and cultivating a new way of being in order to genuinely have that choice. Mm. What do you think it was that made that choice available for you? Do you remember? Was it a moment or something that you saw? Um, no, I think it's been a it's been a much longer journey of of deliberate practice. Um, so one of the first embodied practices that I came to was authentic relating, and then Yin yoga was incredibly important to me. Learning to be with something that felt challenging. I'm not particularly flexible. So being with a yoga posture and not pushing myself because if you've never done yin, you push yourself. If you approach yin yoga like it's Ashtanga, you're not going to walk for a week. <laughs> so like, how could I be with these challenging poses and find some softness? I think that was like the first, the first step for me. And then more recently I've been, um, I have a hula hoop practice. <laughs> so I mentioned it can't be anything more pointless than um, tossing around a plastic circle for a, a while. Um, but seeing my perfectionism like kick back in that says, well, you know, I'm looking at my teachers that have been playing with hoops for 10 years. I'm like, well, I can't do that trick yet. And, and every time I get tense and I try to force it, I'm worse. So hula hooping has been this like really important. Like, it's just it's just a plastic circle. Like it doesn't matter and the more I like, yeah, like, oh, what happens if I do it like this? It, like, the, the better I get at it. So, um, yeah, some very deliberate, sounds ironic, practicing being playful. But practicing the body of being playful, for sure. Yeah. Wow, I think that's brilliant. I think it's brilliant that it occurred to you to go in that direction. It reminds me of, I think it was the first conversation we had. We talked a bit about uncertainty and mm. what i'm hearing in that is that you're discovering the the pleasure and the playfulness of getting curious about what it is you don't know or showing up with something without an expectation that it must look this way so mm. you don't really know exactly what you're going to get you don't know if you're exploring a topic what's going to come out of your mouth mm -hmm. or you don't know if you're exploring a movement what it's going to look like and how it's going to go is it going to take you in the intended direction or not Mm -hmm. But there's something so beautiful about that exploration. And as you said really well, putting us in the space of learning that as, as humans, we're designed for to learn by doing. Um, one of my mentors says it's not learning by trial and error, but learning by error and error. It's like mm -hmm. we just keep, yeah, yeah. We keep screwing up and at some point, we find our way and that's actually how it's meant to be. Not this, I have a plan and I'm going to follow these 10 steps and everything will go exactly the way I want, which yeah. like little mind wants to control. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of um, like watching my nephew start to learn to walk. Like they learn by falling over a lot <laughs> and it's through that that their brain learns like where the, the balance point is. Um, but yeah, I'm really tracking this for myself at the moment. Um, like that seems to me there's sort of two different ways of being with uncertainty. And one is this tight, controlling, everything's contracted, focus, I've got to figure out and uh, how do I find the answer and how do I find the clarity? And what I notice in that body, it's the same body that I have when I'm stressed, right? It's the same body I have when my nervous system is activated. And because this is bi-directional, when I'm in this body, it activates my nervous system. So now my nervous system is saying, well, there must be something scary going on here because we're in the stress response. And so suddenly I see uncertainty as full of, uh, full of fear. Like the, the unknown becomes, you know, there be monsters off the edge of the map and it becomes kind of self-perpetuating. What I'm really starting to, to realize for myself at the moment is that I can be with uncertainty in a really different way that um, uncertainty might, I just, it might just be the, you know, we go through periods of certainty and periods of uncertainty. So it, it, it's the other side of the coin 
And then it's where all the possibility lies, all of the adventure and all of the excitement. And if I can tune into that, then my body is soft and receptive and curious and it's flexible. It's adaptable. I feel more like, you know, I'm a goalkeeper. It's like, oh, I could go in, I could go whatever direction I need to. It's a, it's adaptive and resilient. Um, and suddenly that, un, that unknown say it's full of like mystery and possibility and like, oh, oh, what might be off the edge of the map? And I don't know, that feels like, to me at least, that feels like a much, uh, a much more pleasurable way of being with, you know, the inevitable uncertainty of life. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting because one of, one of my mentors says that we're not, we're not afraid of uncertainty. We're afraid of what we're making up about it. We're not afraid mm. of the unknown. It's the made up unknown, what we make up. Mm-hmm. Because uncertainty is simply just, I don't know. Or unknown is, I don't know yet. It's like, I'm yeah. not sure. I don't know. And there's nothing inherently scary about that until I make something up that, <gasps> but what if it's this? Or what if it's not that? Then it becomes scary. Yeah. Or the story that I should know. Yes. You know, and I'm seeing this a lot at the moment. It's kind of real uh, value for clarity. Like, this is the thing. Like, I must know. You know, this is what it means to be a good person. I must know all of the time. And and that pressure, I think, um, yeah, adds to the stress and the unfair. So if I should know and I don't, well, now I'm doing it wrong. Well, you mentioned something, Vix, that I'm kind of curious about the way you talk about it. You said, when I'm in this body... I feel like this. When I'm in that body, I feel like that. What do you mean? I'm assuming you don't actually have two bodies or more. <laughs> maybe, but... Swap them out like um, there's a, a movie that I'm thinking of. I can't remember the name of But yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, so I, I'm a, a somatic coach. And one of the ways I work with people and I work with myself is to notice the uh, the shaping, the kind of habitual shaping that our, our body has in different states okay. so i said like my my i'm stressed i have to figure it all out way of being like there's a there's a distinct body to that like it has a shaping it has a uh, an emotionality to it like i can and i can put it on like like i'm putting on a coat like i, I can mm-hmm. move in that way and it's like oh yeah right now i'm in this place and then there's yeah there's another another shaping that you know this kind of more open curious uh, body open curious way of being but again I can it's why I, I can move into it's really why I really love somatic coaching work because this is really tangible you know in the yogic traditions the body is the gross layer of our being whereas I can't see my thoughts I can't touch them I can you know they're kind of fleeting and by the time I realize I've had it it's already been through my brain whereas this I you know I can I can move it so I can kind of work with the different ways I want to be in the world from my body up like from the ground up and um yeah in the words of one of my teachers quicker stickier and deeper than nearly any other kind of form of work that I've I've done Mm, interesting well it certainly is true that our bodies are what allow us to feel what we're thinking Mm -hmm. you know so if we bring Mm -hmm. it to mind we can immediately create that feeling in our body whatever that thought is and we can notice it so without the body without those sensations i don't think we would have a way to really be aware of what's happening in our minds so that's kind of cool yeah of course not because our brains are locked away in these little bony boxes like the only way they know what's going on is through this through all of our senses um and yeah so yeah i think what i mean what what you said so um when i think a thought i can feel it in my body that also works the other way the right the shaping that i have the emotion experience that i'm having shapes my thoughts Mm -hmm. so you know often when i'm working with clients if somebody's saying you know I want a new perspective, then, you know, sometimes like we'll literally move to a different place in the room. Like, how does it look from this other place? How, how does it look from, from these different bodies? If I put my body in a different shaping, there are different 
I, I see the world in a different way. Like sometimes very, uh, very literally when I'm in stress response, my gaze narrows and I focus on the problem. Whereas in a, in a more resourced, softer state, my peripheral vision kicks in and I can see out here again, I can see options. So yeah, the, the shaping our embodiment shapes um, what options are available to us because it shapes what we're seeing in the world around us. Hmm. It kind of sounds like as you've been going deeper in that exploration, you're making more and more connections through your experimentation. Like, for example, you were talking about yin yoga, like you're seeing it there. You're seeing extensions of that. And with, with your hula hoop, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that you didn't exactly know you couldn't have known what you were going to see and what you're going to experience when you started, but something mm -hmm. occurred to you and it's sort of taking you on this journey of discovery in all these different things that you're in. I mean, that's what it, it feels like to me as you talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. One of my uh, very good colleagues likes to say, um, we don't have problems, only patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this idea, you know, wherever I go, there I am. <laughs> so, so yeah, I didn't know exactly how the hoop thing was going to work out, but I had a pretty good idea. Like I wasn't surprised to see, oh, like there I am again, there are, there are those patterns. Um, but the, the embodiment of hula hooping is different from the embodiment of yin yoga, for example. So I'm, I'm bringing these practices, bring a different, a different medicine to, to that same pattern. It, it creates, um, uh, helps a build self-awareness to see these patterns coming up in different places and then different practices build more range and the more range I have, you know, we talked about choice earlier on, the more range of, of ways of being, I have more ways of being me that feel authentic and in integrity. That's what gives me choice. You know, cause if there's only one way I know how to be in the world, I'm going to do that, whether it's useful or appropriate. Um, yeah, it's the only way I can do it. Whereas the more, you know, I can be, there's a more, I'm more comfortable with the playful side of me and I'm more comfortable with the slow, emotionally connected side of me. And I'm comfortable with the fiery focus, passionate side of me. Then I can be all of those as, and when I need to in a way that's like really in service of me, in service of what I'm doing in, in the world and, um, and in, in service of wholeness and connection. Mm. I have such a, a feeling of that curiosity and exploration as you talk about it. It's really enjoyable. And I have also experienced firsthand through a bit of your content, some of the, like how nicely they come together, the, the fiery focused part you were talking about, that experience of you with like a slower, um, more emotional, softer side and how they can sort of, sort of play off of each other and express something that might be quite contrarian, but doesn't have a, a harshness or um, it doesn't seem to me anyway to have like a sharp judgmental quality to it. And yet it's mm -hmm. pointing to something that maybe most people don't see or don't want to see or are told the opposite about it in the mainstream. Thank you for that reflection. I really appreciate that. I think that's been a, a lot of my own personal journey of integrating like how do I hold these different aspects of myself in a way that doesn't feel um fragmented um and and there and therefore like doesn't go to the extremes like, this is one of the reasons you know I burnt out a few years ago because I was stuck in in one extreme mm. um so yeah I get really I get really curious to myself and for other people about how do we how do we hold the polarities that we have inside of ourselves in a way that does feel whole and, and authentic and um, yeah, that I get to kind of uh, draw on the strengths of both um, without being stuck at either end. Mm, I like it. Does this feel like, maybe you've used the words of a practice, um, and explore. It actually sounds like fun the way you're talking about it, but I'm wondering, like, does it, does it feel like work or something you have to do, or is it just something you're doing or how are you approaching this exploration? Yeah. Um, all of the above, <laughs> you know, um, 
yeah, sometimes it it requires discipline and commitment. And, you know, I'd rather be lying on the sofa watching reruns of The West Wing, right? <laughs> so, so, yeah, there are times where it does require some I'm kind of work, effort, commitment, and intentionality to it. Um, and, and for me, particularly the, the cultivating that sense of fun and ease in my practices also feels really important because these type of embodied practices, it's not just about what you're doing. It's about how you're doing it. You know, if you show, if I show up to yin yoga with my Ashtanga mind on, like it doesn't matter them holding the pose for five minutes. Like I'm, I'm not doing the thing. I'm <laughs> all I'm doing is doing a very slow Ashtanga practice. Um, so I'm not actually cultivating the the embodiment that I want to. Hmm. So for me, as a perfect, as a recovering perfectionist, bringing the the fun and the ease, like that's the how. Like it doesn't really matter then what practice I'm doing. The how of it becomes um, almost becomes the most important thing. Um, so I um, I really love the Hurry Slowly podcast, Jocelyn, Jocelyn K. Gly. And years ago, she talked about this idea of tender discipline. Mm-hmm. And it's really landed for me. I've kind of taken it and you know made, I play with it in my own way now. But for me, it is that. It's both the having the discipline and the, the fortitude to do things that feel challenging and uncomfortable. And yeah, the lazy part of me would rather not do it. But meeting that with kindness towards myself and um, responsiveness to my cycles and getting out of the self brutalization version of discipline that I had learned, you know, as a perfectionist and through my military career. So, yeah, like uh, <laughs> my default answer for things these days is both and. <laughs> yeah, yeah, rather than either or. Yeah. I like that and that makes that makes total sense. So will you tell me a little bit about what you see as the benefits of well first of all, what is cyclical living and why mm-hmm. you think it's beneficial for us? Mm. Um cyclical living at its essence is uh an awareness practice. It brings me into a closer relationship with myself through all of the different cycles and rhythms that are in my life. Um, Some of those are biological, so uh, the basic activity rest cycle, the REM sleep cycle, for example, uh, my menstrual cycle, um, circadian rhythm. Uh, Others of those cycles are in the world around me, less so now I live in the tropics, but, but, you know, the kind of the seasons, um, um, the moon cycle, the tides, um, and then they're all of the kind of the, I, I want to say human created, but also I, I think, you know, the action learning cycle, the MVP cycle, like so much of our lives is is dominated by by cycles. Some of those we create, some of those we, we intuit. So I would suggest like a project has its own personhood, like it has its own innate rhythm to it. And so cyclical living is, how am I paying attention to what those cycles are and how might I be a little bit more in alignment with, with that? So rather than trying to be somewhere that I'm not or paddling upstream, um, cyclical living is, I guess, a, a really deep moving towards reality as it is, like accepting that this is where things are and now how do I want to show up given that this is, is where I am in a, in a cycle? Um, so for me, it's been, I love it because it's a framework. It's like a blueprint. There's, a, there's enough structure to it that the part of me that really loves to know what's going on can relax. Be like, okay, right, there, there's a map. There's like clear things happening. Great. And then it's also deeply intuitive because it requires me to really pay attention to my body. It's not a, a sense of, you know, this is the right way to be at any given point. Mm. But I can apply this map kind of compass like, okay it helps me get a sense of the lay of the land more and then has given me real permission to be more of me so I can really lean into like the summer version of me like ovulating Vix when I'm like I'm superwoman I can do anything and I want to I'm going to create this and I'm going to do that and nobody can stop me 
and it creates space for uh my inner critic and that like oh my god I can't believe I've just done that like oh, that, I, what am I gonna do and all that stuff that comes through and then there's also space for me to chuck it all in for a while and stop and be like oh okay I'm gonna allow myself to rest and all of those versions of me get to be here uh and I love that mm. what's landing for you in in that little description well the first thing that i notice in it is that i i love the freedom it's brought to you like i can really feel that in how you describe it the freedom to be in all the experiences and have a sense of They all have their place, even if I don't know exactly what's going to show up when, but I know that they do, and that's okay. That it just lets you relax mm -hmm. into whatever it is, is that's happening in your life. And it sort of brought up a question for me, because I've, I have a lot of friends who talk about, they might not use the word cyclical living, but living in the, living with the cycles of nature or mm -hmm. the natural flow of things. And I also am very moved by, in particular, Alan Watts, when he talks about Taoism and Wu Wei, you know, mm -hmm. the path of effortless doing, mm -hmm. the ease that comes from going with the grain of life as opposed mm -hmm. to against it or swimming, like allowing the current to take you and using it rather than mm -hmm. moving against it. One of the things I have had resistance to in this, and maybe you'll speak to it a little bit from how you see it, is that I know very well that if I create an expectation of a cycle in my life, like for example, at this point in my cycle or with the full moon, I have this happen, I can create it because you know we're very, very creative with our minds and our experiences. And so I sort of resist that because I don't want to encourage it. Like I don't usually look at astrology and like what the, what the energies and trends are because I don't want it to influence my own experience of them. What's interesting is that one of my friends who does follow those astrological patterns will tell me, you know, we'll be talking, comparing our experience and he'll tell me what's going on. And it's something that I'm feeling without knowing anything about the astrology that's okay. happening in the moment. And this has happened so many times that I'm like, this is very interesting. Um, and his take on it is it's kind of like the tide chart or um, the what, like looking at a weather report. It just lets you know how you might go with it, respond mm -hmm. with it. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not at all opposed to it. I see so much, I see a lot of wisdom in it because it, it allows us to see and respond to what's happening in our environment instead of trying to impose what my intellect thinks should happen, either mm -hmm. in for, on myself or what's happening around me. So mm -hmm. I'll pause there. You can tell me like what you what you hear that's interesting maybe. Yeah, I feel some resonance with the resistance to something like uh, astrology. And, uh, and what I heard you really reflect on was the influence. Yeah, almost trying to, trying to conform to the external environment. And what I would offer, like where I've really started with cyclical living, has been in my internal rhythms. So, like my menstrual cycle awareness practice is like the key one for me personally, um, because I I don't like the idea of this sort of like external power telling me like the way that it is. Like that's for me like been a really big issue for me in my life personally, and. And I, I think that's a, a really big issue for all of us. Like there's lots of like external voices telling us how things should be um, and not in a very positive way. So I much prefer starting with like using this practice as how do I get to know myself more? So yeah, being able to use like a mental cycle awareness practice or even like a circadian rhythm practice. Like how am I in this moment? And given where I am, what do I need in order to be able to show up for life in the way that I want to? Because I think one way cyclical living kind of gets misinterpreted sometimes is that like, it has to be 
right? So if I'm if I'm in a winter, if I'm bleeding, then I can't do anything. I have to be in the cave. I've, like life doesn't work like that. If you've got kids or you've got a full time job, like sadly we you know most companies don't have menstrual leave policies yet. You know you kind of like uh, as a as a coach, like I have to show up. So the question for me becomes then like, given that I have more of this information about where I am in my cycles, how can I deeply honor my needs and deeply honor the commitments that I have in the world? And my favorite, uh, two favorite questions I have. One is what is a 1% shift that I could make? So it's not about being, again, being in like 100% alignment because it's impossible. Cycles are fractal. I might be in a winter in the day, but in a summer in my menstrual cycle and it's spring in the world. And, it, you know, like, I don't know what's going on. You know, something's going on in the, the astrology world as well. Like, I, I can't do it. But what is it? 1% shift that I, I might make that might bring me into just a little bit more alignment, just a little less resistance. And then the other question that I love for my, my, my mentors at Red School is um, what wisdom is available to me in this place, in this part of my cycle, that wouldn't have been available to me if I was somewhere else? Like, I have, like, each, each season of a cycle, each phase has its own unique properties and power like how can i how can i unlock that and also like how do i survive this like autumn thing that i don't really like that much but like how do i unlock its potential like how does that really serve me and serve what i'm offering into the world um, yeah how does how does that hmm. land for you and, and the, the resistance it's interesting i mean i don't even have a problem with the resistance I think it's kind of funny, actually, the way I rebel against things when I'm the one I'm always rebelling against is myself. It's it can look like it's somebody else, but I'm like, no, I'm the one who <laughs> I make up my own rules and then rebel against them, forgetting that I made them up. And sometimes those <laughs> rules look like somebody else's. So that's kind of interesting. Like, even if mm. I said, OK, I'm going to take on everything that Vix is saying and I'm going to like actually engage with my menstrual cycle and and sort of notice what's happening and and then rage against myself for doing it it wasn't vix's fault it was my choice mm. <laughs> so that laughs that's that's that makes me laugh it's a bit of a tangent um but here's something that i noticed so one of the places that i feel quite highly attuned to my own cycles is with food Mm -hmm. So I noticed, I, I used to have, um, when I was a lot younger, I used to experience hypoglycemia. I ate way too much sugar. Um, if I didn't eat, I would get incredibly shaky and anxious. And I noticed that. So I started to make changes to respond to it in response. So I would always have snacks. And it got to the point where if I didn't eat at a certain at certain intervals, I would become anxious because I was thinking about, I mean, oh, I'm going to need to eat. Mm -hmm. And in the last, I'm going to say like year or two, my partner has pointed out this anxious attachment to food that I have. And there are lots of reasons for it, childhood stuff, all of that, being in times when I really didn't have access to food and, you know, so lots of reasons, mm. good reasons inside of me mm -hmm. for mm. that to happen. And I've gotten sort of curious about it. And I caught myself the other day saying, well, I'm going to need to eat by two o'clock in the afternoon because I'm going to, and I was like, do I actually know that? And it was interesting to catch it, to catch the assumption mm -hmm that I will have this experience because I've had this experience before and I've seen a pattern mm -hmm. of it because the truth is that I don't know I'll be hungry at that time. I don't know mm -hmm. that I'll need food at that time. I don't know how I'll feel at that time. And yet there is a wisdom for me to notice the cycles that I tend to have, the way I tend to experience things like food mm -hmm. and prepare for it, be aware of it. Mm. So it's sort of, like this, I, I kind of feel in it um, being with what is, recognizing a habit, a pattern, a way of being, a cycle that I seem to be exhibiting, and also sort of showing up with it in a way that's curious about what my experience is now because it might be different, and it often is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
that's such a beautiful example of, of this and I really appreciate you for for sharing how this one shows up for you personally um but yeah it, it is this both and but yes there's a framework and over time you know my cycles do have patterns there you know there are you know I typically feel similar ways on similar days of of cycles or at similar times of day for example and and I can make choices based on that so you know I can choose to not schedule calls or like organize my work day in a particular way and this isn't a performance like it is as I say signal awareness, awareness is an awareness practice it's like inviting me back into the present moment like checking in okay so I'm day whatever it is day 25 like what does day 25 feel like for me today and then again like marrying both of those bits of information together so this is where I'm at now this is what I know about how this usually sits for me and where it is in my cycles hey now what do I want to do with that information like do I do I actually want to have a snack right now or you know is there something else that I that I need again so that I might take care of myself and still honor like the commitments that I have to to the rest of the world mm. uh, I get very curious about the discrepancies so like what is it that allows me to show up differently than what my cycle or my normal experience of myself would point to. So for example, there are, I know that there are days when I don't have enough sleep and I'm just like, mm -hmm. the whole rest the next day, mm -hmm. right? Just, just blah. And then there are other days, but I know that's not always the case. Sometimes I don't get enough sleep and I do really well. It doesn't seem like it's affecting my performance at all and certainly not my spirits. Maybe I'm tired at the end of the day, but it just sort of, it reminds me that I think that while yes, we are, we are flowing with the cycles of nature and we are that nature. It is, it is us also. We're far more flexible and changeable than I would think otherwise. You know, it's, it's, it isn't this is one way and this is always the way that it is so i get curious about that and what i see in the when things don't match up the way i would think yeah well i you know i might suggest like part of that is that there isn't one cycle like <laughs> i said like the cycles are fractal so at any one point like all of these different cycles are kind of interacting and then yeah you throw like did i have an argument with my partner in there how well did i sleep um you know how well i've been have i been meeting my other needs but like, i would be really curious for you like with sleep for example if you were tracking something like your menstrual cycle um i'm not going to say this is the case but i could imagine a scenario where you know you track that over several months and you realize huh i'm much more vulnerable to sleep deprivation at this point of my cycle whereas in like you know when i'm ovulating sleep deprivation impacts me less and and that may be true for you that may not be true mm. for you but this is and again this is what i really love about it it gets to be this blend of both data mm. like i can like track whether i personally don't particularly enjoy the apps um, i much prefer kind of like journaling with my cycle tracking gives me more more flexibility to be with my experience rather than just putting more stuff into my phone but but yeah i can have like data and like look at what the trends and the patterns are and then there's this yeah the intuitive present moment of right what what is happening right now and like what are all the the different intersections of bits of my experience that are, are co-creating this thing for me right now mm. um because our cycles shift as well like my my i turn 41 next week and my cycle is different. My experience of my cycle is different compared to where I started this, you know, eight or nine years ago. Um, you know, I'm starting to edge towards perimenopause. There's a whole other phase of my cyclical life, like on the on the horizon for me now. Um, you know, I experience it in in the seasons. You know, I lived in London. My uh, 
uh, my desire to go running at five in the morning is very different <laughs> in December when it's cold and wet and dark compared to the height of the summer. Like, again, it's, it's there is no one right answer. Nothing is static. Like, how do I keep coming back to what's true right now and um, and being responsive to that? Hmm. Where I go with it. is I go to the question of like, do I, do I need a framework? Do I want a framework? Do I want to track this? Do I need the data or is my experience enough? And I'm not saying there is a right or a wrong in either of those choices. It's more like mm -hmm. for me right now, because mm -hmm. I, because I have tracked things um, at some points in my life. And because I think it came from an, an inner wisdom like to say, hey, Steph, pay attention to this in your life and what's sure. happening here. Like, look at this pattern, trends, whatever, for a while and notice something. I've done this actually with marketing and experiments and like kind of seeing how I show up differently. Um, and that was and that was really helpful. And at the same time, I really love the idea of. What if I don't hold on to anything? What if I don't, um, you know, what actually is, it's not just scaffolding or a framework or a map, but what can I stand on that's here for me mm -hmm. always in and out of any of these experiences, the changes, the cycles, the seasons. And something about that feels really amazing, but sometimes that leads me to, look at the cycles, right? You know, like I, I'm not mm -hmm. saying it isn't yeah, either yeah. or it's a both and, and yet knowing that, what is it? It's, it's, I think it's like, for me, it's the feeling, the feel of nature, the, the aliveness within me that guides me, that directs me. The same thing that enlivens me and everything is supporting me. That's what I hear in Wu Wei. Mm. It's, there is no, what is it? There is a path, but there is no one who walks the path. Mm -hmm. It is this, this happening. It is yeah. this unfolding. And I am a part of it, whether I fight against it or try mm -hmm. to create it cross purposes or I flow with it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I really love that perspective. But, and, and there's something beautiful about that. that this is, this is happening within us, whether we're paying attention to it or working with it in a dedicated way or not. Like this is this is what it means to be human. This is what it means to be in this in this world is to have cycles and flow and and things. And um, yeah, I, I think there's something beautiful for people to take to experiment with this and 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 figure out the way that this this works for them. And I, I would offer for, for me, like, um, recovering from perfectionism, I, I've, had to, I've had to develop that sense of trust. Like, I, I have not had that for nearly all of my life. And even now, like, it still kind of comes and goes. So, you know, you were talking earlier about kind of uh, intentional practices and, and a, an embodiment, a way of being one of the things I have really appreciated about something like cyclical living is it has, uh, it's really supported me in developing that sense of, of trust. So now like my, my aware, my menstrual cycle awareness practice isn't particularly active. Like I don't, I don't sit and journal and track in perhaps the same way I did a few years ago because it is more embodied and more intuitive, but to get to the place where it, I can surrender to it, I had to go through the kind of the, the disciplined focused um oh, it's the focus yeah the, the intentional practice like it's like learning learning a musical instrument or a language or a martial art like you kind of have to go through you have to practice your scales <laughs> um in order to get to the place where that you can um uh you can ad lib and uh, improvise on the on the spot hmm. that's interesting So I'm wondering, Vix, of, of all these things that you have discovered and and seen that have been really helpful for you, 
in moving away from perfectionism, enjoying your life more and becoming more embodied and creating a, a life and a business and experience that you enjoy more as a human. What, what would you love for people to know that you think would make the biggest difference for them in their lives? Oh, my initial response to that is I, I don't want to make that assumption for other people. Like I, I don't, I don't know what is the one thing that somebody else needs to hear. For me, remembering, remembering that I'm, I'm already whole. Like, that yeah, there might be skills I want to get better at, or more things I'm able to be doing in life. But I'm fundamentally this this messy, flawed, imperfect, slightly traumatized, um, you know, version of me. Like that's it. That's what it means to be be human. Like it's absolutely enough. I'm absolutely enough as I am. Anything else is 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 part of the journey. I'm I'm so. I'm so sick of this this narrative that says like we just we always have to be working on ourselves. We always have to be improving, and we always have you know. I even saw something just recently was like, oh, you know, it's not about competing with other people; it's about competing with yourself. You know, be one percent better than you were yesterday. I was like, fuck that! Like, oh my god! Like if like oh like that is internalized capitalism. Capitalism is, says like I need a one percent return on my investment all of the time. Like, how do I make more money from the investment that I put in? But I'm a human being. I'm not. I'm not a piece of capital. I don't need to appreciate. I'm. I'm good. Like that. The the and not just the intellectual knowing of that, but fe feeling that deep in my bones. Um, yeah, that of, of all of the all of the plants I I do, they all keep bringing me back to that that place. Mm hmm. That's gorgeous. And it might just be me, but I think everyone, I'm going to say this, actually, I think everyone would benefit from knowing that feeling of wholeness of themselves. It might not be the perfect message for them in this moment. I couldn't know that. We couldn't know that. But that message is gorgeous. I feel it when you say it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So Vix, if people would like to explore more of what you're into and find out more about you, where's the best place for them to go? Yeah, um, I'm pretty easy to find on, on the internet. There aren't many Vix Andertons in the world. So uh, my website is vixanderton.com. Um, Vix underscore Anderton on Instagram is the main place I hang out on social media. Um, but yeah, yeah, those are probably the two main two main places or if you happen to be passing through Ubud in Bali anytime soon then come by say hi <laughs> <laughs> oh it gives me an excuse do I need an yeah, excuse yeah. to come to Bali <laughs> I've never been oh well this has been so lovely Vix thank you so much for sharing what you're seeing what's in your heart and your message I really appreciate it and I'm very happy that it's in the world thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come and share some of that stuff it's been a pleasure Thanks so much for joining me for today's Wildspire conversation. If you'd like to receive a weekly Wildspire email from me filled with inspiring stories, unmarketing experiments, tips for playing your way to impact and income without the hustle and hype, insights from my spiritual business journey, and more, go to theawakenedbusiness.com forward slash Wildspire. Until next time, may you know yourself as the gorgeous wild creation you are.